when a fight breaks out in public, my generation broke it up. Yeah. This generation videotapes. Right. And videotape is the wrong word. Yeah. They record it on their phone. Yeah. It's horrible. Now, I, is I, I, I have, we're just desensitized. By the way, there's, you want to talk about me being the old school. There's video of me, Chumley from the show Pawn Shop. Him and some of his horrible friends started kicking a guy on Hollywood Boulevard and beating the crap out of him. And I'm the one who jumped in the middle and broke it up, and it's it made TMZ. Pat, I didn't whip out a phone. Pat was like, how, how I was the good guy in Tour Wars, and you guys need to stop I, this right <laughs> now. Well, now I- So, case in point, a show that was really popular in the UK uh, called Naked Dating. Did you see this one? Where the they're yeah. in a, a box and it goes up. You look at their feet first, then their dick. And no, no, up. it's it's not called Naked Dating. Oh. It was called Physical Attraction. Oh, that's sorry, a okay. Naked Attraction. And I'll tell you, not only do I know the show, Robbie and I were on uh, vacation. We started in England. We went to uh, Italy, and when we were in England, we're laying in bed and we took thank you, yeah. cheers. We went to watch TV and. That came on, and we could not stop watching it. And now, to this day, we talk about when we're naked, we're like, I'm going to show you one of my thirds. <laughs> because they show you in thirds? Well, I was going to tell you, from my experience, I watched a episode, and I didn't need any more. As far as right. for, for the shock value. But I will say, from a production standpoint, it's... Uh, it's kind of structured in a. You just very, don't like European genitals. Well, yeah, they I terrify me. Yeah, but they're very scary. Yeah, they're all fucking. First mangled. of all, genitalia in general. Yeah. Uh, w- from what you see in porn and magazines compared to real life, oh yeah, the variations of the theme, oh yeah. scary. I don't need to see any more than I've seen in my yeah. life. Terrifying. But the fun part of that show, which I think was great in the structure, is they actually did have in a very short time a way to emotionally connect the people. Because remember, they'd go on a date, right, and then you'd catch up with them, and if they were still together, right. Right, so, right. If they just showed the naked people, which is my point. That's what I was. It's by my point on. Every single show I've done in life is that uh, – and, and I've said this on other shows I've done. When the story isn't going where they think it's going and producers are like, well, something needs to happen. I'm like, well, lean into what is happening. You know, right. that if people are banging it out. Well, that's kind of interesting. But them not banging out can be interesting too. You just have to accept what is actually happening. But that's the – that's what we're going to probably talk about is the, sure. the evolution or devolution of reality as a genre. If we can, I'd like to start off with back in 1995 when you launched the Mark Wahlberg show. Okay. So, uh, first of all, there's so many things about that uh, that I'd like to address. First of all, I can't believe I'm at the point where we're talking about my career is like back in 1995. And that's so fucking long ago. It doesn't seem that long ago to me, but it's so long ago. And, uh, and the other thing is when I, uh, launched that, but I was a passenger on that whole talk show thing, but it was, you know, it was, it was a thing. Can I give you my perception of it when, when sure. it launched? Okay. Sure. So, uh, to tell the youngins in here, Dylan and Kaylin in the early nineties, are we going? Yeah, are we in going. the co- are we in the show right yeah, now? Yeah, we're going. Going. No way! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> By the way, you have been brilliant so far. Oh, thank you so <laughs> Your much. Your insights have been just on point. I know. Yeah. I don't even know how I spoke them while I was texting. <laughs> hey, but, uh, <laughs> by the way, uh, I don't know which podcast you're watching. So if you're watching Bonfire Talks, welcome. And if you're watching Bad TV, hi. welcome. Yeah. Hi. Okay, so Mark, 1995, you get that talk show. So during that period, I'd never experienced this in my life where suddenly an entire genre of television just gets dumped on you. So I was in college, and you have a lot of free time in between classes. And the programming from so, 90... So I've read. Well, you're not supposed to have a ton. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I did for the several weeks I went to college. <laughs> uh, from 9 a.m. till 3 in the afternoon was... Back to back talk shows, talk shows, and it was coming off. It and originally started, I think, with the Phil Donahue show in the early '80s, or something probably predated that's, that. That's probably right. Okay, so that's the one that in our uh, zeitgeist and consciousness is the maybe the first. So then we have not the first, but it seems like the first. We have the knockoffs, but as maybe we talked earlier, I didn't know if it made it to the podcast. That we were trying to really grab audiences by with the, the handbag of dumb tricks, which is let's just shock the audience. Right? Well, it didn't start that way. So you got to talk about Phil Donahue first. So and we, we shouldn't get too in the weeds, but 
But Mark, this is a Mark. Don't let him take us this far into the weeds. <laughs> okay, of I'm 90s, gonna get us out of it. 90s talk shows. We can't be here for that long. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the host thing where I bring it up to what is relevant to reality yeah, TV. Thank you. So reality TV as we know it now. Okay, I usually don't even call it reality TV. I used to call it unscripted drama, but even that is a stretch because while I can say that the shows that I've worked on are unscripted. I can't say, and I can't say from experience either, but I get the sense that the audience also gets the sense that things are to some degree driven and scripted that, that's in a, most of reality today. Yeah, that's a, lo- that's a lovely euphemism for what reality television is. Um, because I'm a little bit cynical just because we recap things that are, I mean, I think that they should be in the penal code as not an ethical thing to do like 90 day fiance. It's well, let's just start not like, so let's start back to get, to get to where Patrick is going. Yeah. And by the way, I've seen your podcast and a little bit cynical. I think you're under a mess estimating there too. <laughs> um, so let's, let's, if we're in all transparency, if we're, we're going to do working, penal codes here. We're all working on ourselves. That's right. Well, now Mark, you're in my wheelhouse. I like that. Now, Mark, to be fair to you though, the shows that you've hosted are structured, so they don't need to be as they, what do they say? Uh, cooked because you have people, People, yeah, they- your, yours has like a, a veneer to it and a structure to it. There's there's heart to it. There's it, there's a, a gradient of reality TV. So let's let's do a quick dive, quick, yeah, of what I think. Because if you ask people where do reality TV start, they'll start with the real world, yeah, uh, cops or cops. <laughs> yeah. But I say it's not that. Mm. I say that if you really go back far enough, daytime TV was game shows and soap operas. Yeah. And then, I don't even know the first, then there was the Mike Douglas kind of vibe, which comes later in the Rosie O'Donnell world, which is, and, which is what Kelly Clarkson and, um, and Drew Barrymore shows like that are today. Great so that show was going on got over there. Yeah. Right? Unbelievable. But when we talk about reality as we know it and unscripted TV and the reality shows we have now, the talk show started as almost news. Human interest episodes. Phil Donahue, I can remember people wanting him to run for office, yeah. right? And then, and you know, and then the Oprah world and that stuff. I don't know timeline wise, but then there was a turn with the Jerry Springer, Richard Bay, right. where sensational uh, Morton Down, uh, Morton Downey Jr. Junior. You wanted like, people punching on stage, midgets arguing. fighting. Right? Yes. Well, that started a little bit that way. Yeah. It started with Phil Donahue talking about things that hit home and were like stories you wouldn't hear. And then it got a little bit further. And then it got to the point where I got into the game, which is that reality TV got not only – not reality TV. Talk show TV got so – what you're talking about. um, uh, So over the top that it was now getting scripted again. And that was one of the things that drove – that actually drove me into a nine-month anxiety attack – now, and which so, was my producer scripting shit and me going, no, sure, no, I won't have that. And so just to let the audience know, that would be a producer would tell a couple that were married and the husband was cheating on the wife. They basically tell them at some point, I need you to get up and slap your husband. Well, so I've heard, but more importantly, you know, seriously, I, I don't know that to be true, but yeah. more importantly is producers. This is what I would bust on my show, which is way past this line of demarcation I'm talking about, we were well into it. Right. Um, where I would say, it, I would ask a question, hey, has this guest ever, you know, where'd you get this guest? And they say, oh yeah, they were on Charles Perez or they were on Jenny Jones two years ago and they did this show and we'll have them back, they're great. Yeah. And I go, got it. And if I had the balls where they are now, like fully in my sack, yeah. I'd have fired people. What What were they, what were they known for? Like why they would... Who? The, the these, guests or these the people, the the guests that these people were like, oh, we gotta have these people on. They're great. What were they? Some kind of freak the, show? Like, when you understand how the machine works in a t- a talk show, and then you can extrapolate that out to what then becomes reality TV, you'll understand. So it goes like this: executive producer, host, whatever. We got five shows to do this week. Segment producer team, which is a producer and an associate producer in most formats, yeah. have to now book and pitch an episode. The topic may have come up and signed off on, and now you got to go fill it. So you got X amount of days to find guests to fill out, and at the time, it was seven, eight, nine guests you'd have to have. So, yeah. Mark, just give Dylan context to that question. So I think he's kind of searching for what was your niche. So Maury Povich is obviously 
uh, doing the uh, DNA test for children. So that's <laughs> that's also an ev- evolution or devolution of the real of the talk show where the it had ladder. to get specific. Yeah, right. Uh, ladder for yeah, sure. Right. Um, so my thing was this: the couple years there were talk shows that were doing great two seasons before me. Um, and you and a lot of them, Sally Jesse, Jenny Jones, Geraldo Richard Rivera, Bay, Geraldo Rivera. So, uh, so sorry, sorry, Gordon sorry. Elliott. So just to give some context, I think your year where you jumped in was probably the height of just how many people were coming into the game. At, there were 24, 20, there were nine new and 24 on the air. And I was on CNN regularly because uh, Sam Nunn, Joe Lieberman and Bill Bennett, I think, were senators who were calling for legislation to regulate uh, reality TV, uh, not reality TV, talk shows. Yeah. Because Jenny Jones, two seasons earlier, had had an ambush segment where a murder then happened. Uh, that guy just got let out of jail last year. That shows you how fucking old I am, that someone has actually served terms for yeah. murder <laughs> and been paroled. No, it's gross. Yeah. So, and this, from an emotional standpoint, yeah. was a, a pivotal year in my life because... All right, so re- that's where talk shows were. Then Ricky Lake came out. So young talk show was a new thing, right? So unbeknownst to me, there had been a mandate through the town. We need a young, hip, cool, good-looking guy yeah. to be a counter to Ricky Lake in the next season. Um, and That was you? I guess. It became me and Charles Perez, I re- who I re- was also a producer on talk shows. So that became a weird thing. And there was all sorts of shit going on over there. Well, Mark, uh, what I remember, Mark, is obviously I didn't know you from anything else, but your show seemed a little bit more mature than some of the other new entries. We had that girl from 90210. We had Gabrielle Carteris. We were partners in that. This was also the first year that station groups would sign off on a show. So the the agreement was um, the New World stations, it doesn't really fucking matter, would take the Gabrielle Cartera show and the Fox stations would take the Mark Wahlberg show so we would start launched already. But what you're going to speak to is the tone of the show where mine was a little different. Uh, and I, there were two things about my show. One was I got hate mail because it seemed like I um, was too, um, too much of an advocate for black people, which is true. Because yeah. that's just who I was and am. Yeah. And so I got hate mail about that. Right. That why was I, you know, having so many black guests and things like that. Yeah. But the thing that drove me into literally therapy and the darkest period of my life was that the sh- talk shows were fake and I couldn't do fake. Yeah. So to give an example, the blue cards, typical in the talk show world. Everybody had blue cards with all the questions because right. these producers, I started to say, whose job it is to score on this hour, yeah. would do anything they could to make the episode work. Right. Lie, cheat, and steal. So they give me a dossier the night before, like on every show we're going to do, which I would read and memorize. So when we're in studio and they hand me the blue cards, we'd be in the break and they go through the questions. You can ask this, you can ask this, you can ask this. And they've rehearsed them to answer. Mm-hmm. And I go, yep, yep, yep. And then they say, okay, we're back in 20. And I'd hand them the blue card and walk out on the, on the uh, uh. set. And they're like, what the fuck? And I'm like, well, I've read it. We've talked about it. We're going to now have a, we're going to do the show now. Right. Yeah. So to me, I didn't know how to do fake. Right. Yeah. And I was in constant, I was just. A wreck. Right, right, right. Dylan right. and I hate fake. I was uh, the lead in a reality show that never went to pilot, but never went series because I pushed Great back. Great show. Great show. <laughs> I pushed back on the fakeness. Pat, what was the show called? Tour Wars. It was about my business when I owned a sightseeing tour company on Hollywood. By the Walmart. way, now, as the mercenary and whore that I am, do whatever the fuck they say. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, these idiots. I'm, they, kidding, I'm kidding. These idiots, their idea, because there was a script, we go to film, and on the day of filming, it was, and by the way, I'm supposed to be the good guy, the lead. We had female competitors that opened a tour company across the street. And in the scene, I'm supposed to go take their kiosk and throw it on Hollywood Boulevard. And I'm asking these idiots, I'm supposed to be the good guy. How does this work? Right. It wasn't that you had like an ethical conflict with what they were asking you to do. You just wanted to be the good guy on the show. (laughs) Mark, what was the biggest, did you ever have like um, the biggest conflict you ever had on that set where you're like, fuck this? Uh, The biggest conflicts I had had nothing to do with the content of the show. Now I did shows when I had um, uh, 
let me see if I can remember the names. And uh, from the Nation of Islam, I had uh, Conrad Muhammad, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, and I had uh, Oliver North on. Who they they were trying to turn the corner for me to talk about racism and politics right, and things right. like that. So I had big conflict happening on the show, but that was nowhere near what was going on in the office for me. Wow. Anybody, it, any fights, any Geraldo Rivera, Jerry Springer fights? Uh, it never got, you know, I, the truth is so many of my memories from the talk show are repressed. Um, and then they show up with people like kidding me in DM saying, do you know where that episode is where, and you remember it because my mother right. went crazy. Right. I'm like, I don't fucking remember. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I don't really have memories of, of it getting out of control like that. But that says a lot about my approach which I've gotten in trouble with in current shows. I won't let it, I wouldn't let it go there. I, I, and, yeah. and as a TV guy, I now know and have known forever that it's in everybody's best interest to let it go. The Jerry Springer, let it go entirely off the oh rails. My gosh. And they go, Oh man. Uh. But they I must have absolutely hated you. Cause I you weren't rough. doing it. Yeah. I wouldn't, do, I would, I would, I would, but I was creating great TV right. in the place where someone that you were writing off as worthless, right. I would not judge and kind of get down and say, let's really talk about it. And yeah. that would be good TV. No, they wanted rednecks to fight each other. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the, well, I had you, enough of that in my childhood. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Oh, are you a redneck? No, I was, I lived amongst them. <laughs> did you really? Where did you grow up? Uh, South Carolina. South Carolina. Okay. In the seventies. All right. Yeah. And my mom 60s, just moved 70s. there. Greenville. Yeah. Greenville's gorgeous. Yep. Um, so the Charlotte Airport. Oh, that's in North Carolina. Yes, North, yes. but that's a typical. <laughs> that is typical. I say I'm from South Carolina, and they go, "Oh, I have friends in North Carolina." Yeah. Like we don't exist as a state. <laughs> no, <laughs> you don't even have your own major airport. I'm going to visit my mom in. That's Charlotte months. Airport, though, Mark. I was there last week. It's a marvelous airport. The um, rocking chairs. There is a famous video <laughs> of the producer chairs. of Jerry Springer when there was a major fight when the set just lights up like a brawl. The producer of that show, I think we just lost him last year. He is running around backstage saying, we're going syndicated. Yeah. Like, and that and that vibe, that, that underlying tone of all TV, yeah. I have railed against my entire career. Game show, talk show, variety show, reality yeah. show. I've never been the proponent of make them bleed for my money. Yeah. I can't fucking deal with it to the point where even in modern times, and this is a failure on my part, in a reunion show, I had to learn the skill to let it go off the rails a little bit. Yeah. More than I'm, let me just say, far more than I'm comfortable with. Right. And then... Yeah. Try to bring something to it. Right, right. So can we talk about the other show that you're most famous for, which is hosting Temptation Island? I know we probably can't get into a lot we of it. T- we can talk about it a little uh, bit. Okay. I was dating a girl. I want to say the year was 2001 or 2000. What oh, year? the original Temptation Island. That's what I'm talking well, let's about. Let's fucking talk about that. Oh, okay. So se- 9-11 happened that Season year. one, if uh, <laughs> new audience members, uh, obviously if you've listened to Mark from Mark's podcast, you know the show that he's hosted. But and the word he's trying TV. to say is podcast. It wasn't exactly, he didn't quite say it, but it's okay. <laughs> so um, for our audience, it yeah. was a show where couples come on and then you tempt each of the couples with very, very attractive people. And then they bang. Sometimes. Nope. Yeah. Not in the original. Not in the original. No That's banging. A, kissing. L- you want to really you, you take the uh, Mandela effect out of this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's what actually happened. Right. Four really gorgeous couples, 15 guys, 15 girls. Coming in on a boat. A, that's a whole behind-the-scenes story. That, that I was hilarious. I was love that. crazy shit that went down. Um, if, you, if you had any idea how loose production was, like figuring it out every day, like reinventing the show every sure. day, yeah. um, which we should talk about because that's really about the birth of reality TV, that mm-hmm. kind of vibe. Anyway, um, I mean, Ridley Scott did that with Gladiator. It was so a it seven episode. Yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah, but that was for millions of dollars. Yeah, I know. But so that still. was far more egregious than us pissing away 600 grand. Yeah, I know. Um, Good movie. That's though, what right? the budget oh, for the first season was? I don't even know. I'll tell you that it was, I'll tell you that there were three, I think three concepts that Fox, Mike Darnell at Fox bought. Temptation Island was one of them. And because reality TV wasn't a thing. Yeah. Big Brother had come out as the first big primetime reality show. That was before Survivor? Yeah, then Survivor, if I'm correct. I could be wrong. It's the same year? Yeah, but within months of each other. Does he Google anything? Uh, 
First of all, I prefer you use his name and not his pronoun. I don't know how you, Kalen, you guys treat Kalen, but to me, I live in desperate need of his approval. <laughs> Kalen, did you get the clips I sent you, by the way? No, I didn't. Uh, check your email. I'm, I'm on my email. Oh. <laughs> all right. So later, later on uh, down the line, we're going to, I have this segment that is going to be really fun where mm-hmm. we are going to, it's, it's called the worst reality TV shows. And by worst, <laughs> is I it mean, headed, very, hosted by Mark Wahlberg. Cause I've probably done most of them. Absolutely not. Because it's shows where the intentions of the production were so evil. Is the swan on there? The swan is absolutely on there. The uh, swan is could If people in space saw that show, that would be what they would say is the problem with our entire civilization. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 What was the... Well, that, uh, wasn't that born out of Extreme Makeover? Well, I think Extreme Makeover came later. After. What yeah. was the show uh, where they just look at people and they rate them one out of ten? That's going to be one of the shows. It's okay. called Are You Hot? Well, Mark, what are the kind <laughs> of... Maybe all the same producer, by the way. What are the kind... Like, what's the psychological makeup? And I'm sure that it's obviously a spectrum, but is there like... Um, a through line of mental illness for the people that apply for these reality television shows. Like what, what is going on with these people? Why would you ever go and do this? Let me start by saying who hurt you. And do you want to talk about it? (laughs) Um, The world. Okay. I understand. And and by the way, another episode, we can, we can chop this up. Yeah. I'd love to. Um, I don't look at it that way. And you got to put it in, in decade or, or which which era of reality TV? I think that I, I look at the people on the show of coming on for whatever reasons doesn't matter, especially my show because I have some control over what's going to go down there uh-huh. and what, how we talk about it. Um, but see, it's really hard to answer that question. I'm not. I'm not trying to be evasive. Yeah, is that these days in the past five years, social media the is cloud. a reality right, show. Right. So you don't even. And I like to lean into that. I say. If you're here for clout, it doesn't fucking matter to me. Right. Yeah. It's going to get real. I'm going to be real. Sure, sure. And the and I say to them on camera and off camera, I say, look, the route to getting clout and the route to finding answers that is are, doing it, this. It's the exact same thing. Right. It's be real. Right. Like you don't get clout if you fake it. That's interesting. Not really caring about the the clout chasing because yeah, at the end of the day, if you're if you're going to get the clout, you have to do well on the show, and the only way if to you're do well get the clout, you have to be authentic. Yeah, either a villain or a positive or whatever. But yeah. if you front, right, we smell it. And you know where I learned that? I learned it well before this. Dick Clark. Do, do you, either of you know of who course. Dick Clark is? Yeah, he's okay. the guy that you, did. You the, guys don't, but Dick Clark was like an icon in our business as a host and a producer. Every job that Ryan Seacrest has now, that's what Dick Clark had. Dick Clark was the guy that did um, American Bandstand, uh, American Bandstand, and Law and Order. Right? No, Pro- that's bloopers. Dick Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> Dick Clark at some point had. Three shows on television. I, I'm just going to take a moment and hope you did that for comedy. <laughs> I love that moment so much. Who knows? And Dick Clark right now, literally in his grave, would be like, how the <laughs> fuck do you compare me to Dick Wolf? Um, I, all right, so I have to ask you about Temptation Island. So, what, what, the, the, the Dick Clark reference is that he says, if you have an Achilles heel, be the first to say it. So owning what is, right. is what I've learned to do as a producer, as a talent, as a person. Yeah. So pretending it isn't that, smacks of bullshit right. so when we know why you're on tv mm-hmm. but we pretend like that's why on the bachelor after they have had their first meeting and they go i really could see this working out i think i'm in love yeah you roll your eyes we all love it because it's professional wrestling but nobody's buying that and it becomes a cliche joke on snl yeah right, right. and i kind of work as a host on any show i do that's not specific to any show to call out that part yeah, yeah and yeah. then build from there because once we say it like if i let you in on the joke like if I say, look, let's be real. Yeah. Then we're real, and then there's somewhere to go. Right, right, so that's, right, right. That's Mark. That's a philosophy that's not, by the way, popular, nor do my producers even fucking love Yeah, that. no, but it's interesting. We, you know, like, we need not the fourth wall. Like, let's just kind of, let's do it's this It's either reality thing. TV or it isn't. Right. Mark, um, I always look at Temptation Island as the dawn of reality TV, like real reality, reality TV. So it was, for me, Survivor. Well, Big Brother, Survivor, and then we were the next one. That's right. But let's talk about that for a minute. I started to say this, that the three shows that Fox bought were 
it was cheaper to shoot the entire se- season than to do a pilot. And mm-hmm. by the way, there was another thing that we were going to say about that earlier when we said they they bang it out and they were making out. In the first season back in 2001, there were seven episodes. The moment, the viral moment that wasn't viral then but would be viral now is that on the beach in the sixth episode before the finale. They banged. They kissed on the beach, Ugh. and we saw it. <laughs> See, that's the cynicism. You have, you're like the guy who, who, you know what this is? This is the television equip, equivalent of the guy who's watched so much porn they can't fuck anymore. I don't need you to psychoanalyze me right now, Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> Mark, let me tell you that's something. That's not going to stop me. So Whether you need it. That's never been the criteria. Are you, bi- are you big into therapy, Mark Wahlberg? We just did a whole fucking episode about it. Really? Yeah. Do you have a therapist that you've been to like for a long time? I've only started therapy this year. Okay. But I'm big into self-exploration. Yeah. I'm big into the real you as opposed to the fake you. You can hear you've done a lot of work. Well, I'm still trying to figure it out. My wife just we just taped an episode earlier where my wife literally proved how much I I don't know. Yeah. So it's a you know, this is... This is Wives just, will do that, though, won't they, Mark? Well... And if you don't do that, you don't keep a wife. 100%. Right. 100%. Sorry if I can bring this back to reality TV. So, I mean, we could also talk about like the collective unconscious and like trying to find out who we are as men. I'm going to let you do that. No, I. I think this is you saying I want to, and I just want to let you know that this is a safe space for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a very safe space. <laughs> so, Kaylin, in my phone, I have five clips. I, did you search I, I got them? it. You sent them. <laughs> Thank you. Email, but I know I did. When you're ready to do the segment, we'll take a quick ad break, and I can pull them all. Sounds great. Right. All right, so let me get to my damn point. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, in 2000 or 2001, I'm dating this beautiful girl. We were totally in love, and what? we started. What uh, email did he send you? sent it to my Adam Carolla email. Because I just saw Kaylin. I just had it under Kaylin. All right. So... <laughs> we were at Ralph's buying dinner and we were rushing home to watch the finale of Temptation Island. The uh, OG TV. OG. Yeah. We couldn't drive well, but fast. There enough. was nothing like that on TV. No. It was it was a dating it was basically the concept was Survivor's a hit. How do we do sexy yeah. sexy survivor? And that's why he watched it because he wanted to race home to get all smutted up. Mm-hmm. Because it was, you know, it was a romance drip. Well, it would raise questions because that's how what great reality TV can do is you watch it as a couple and it gets you kind of like talking about it. Like, oh, I hate him or he's a liar or I think she really likes him. That's that's how you get a viral or a really popular reality TV show. By the way, what were your numbers in 2000 for that? Highest rated show in the history of Fox. Can I wow. take a guess? I don't know what the numbers were, quite honestly, but it was like in a double digit share. Okay. What it, year? What years was that? 1872. 1872. 2000, 2000 2001. During, it was during Reconstruction. Okay. Um, so. No, 2001, I think. Yeah. So up oh, to right. that. Year 9-11, we covered we it. We were the highest rated show uh, eclipsing, I think, the finale of Melrose Place or something like that. So that's mm-hmm. probably 40 million people. It was. I right know, for the I finale. Know, it was 40 million, but maybe I was going to say 30. 20. Yeah. Well, Bachelor's highest rating ever was, I think, 18 million, and it was the Bob... Uh, Bob Queen, Guinea season. Queenie Queen, the first year, I think that one. Uh, not the no, it eclipsed that because it was really popular the first season and then I think it was by season four was Bob Guinea. My understanding <laughs> is that The Bachelor was born out of Temptation Island. That ABC saw Temptation... It, it, it all happened so quick. You got to understand that reality TV was not only not popular, it wasn't a thing at all. And then what happened was, and, and to point, uh, case in point, is that they could shoot an entire season of my show and never air it was cheaper than doing a proof of concept why, pilot. Why? Because it's cheaper. Oh, how is it cheaper to shoot a whole season? Dylan, because that, to do a pilot of Temptation Island, you still have to go to the island. You still have to do all that stuff. Right. And because reality TV is not episodic like a scripted drama, it's just an experience that happens over two weeks of taping. Yeah. Okay. You amortize the cost. It's just easier. Just just do it. So it then is. Then we'll decide if we're going to air it's it. It's the not. amortization part of it. It's uh, obviously still cheaper. Right. Okay. Yeah, considerable. Like in other words, I don't know the numbers, but I'm going to give you a concept back then. It's still you could do a, you could do the yeah. whole season of Temptation Island for less than a million back then, right? Where every episode of Law and Order by Dick Clark, Dick Clark, uh, yeah. uh, Dick Wolf, um, it, it would get the same ratings and cost you millions. Well, I'll say this: so an episode <laughs> of Ally McBeal, 
on Fox was $3 million back you, in 1999. So I, and that would have been the entire budget for the first two seasons of Temptation Island. Well, maybe and, at least, certainly the two seasons. Wait, what? Ally McBeal cost $3 million an episode? Oh, I couldn't believe when I actually heard what the actors were being paid, my mouth dropped. But that's typical. But that's typical. And residuals. And res- I still get a check from working on that show. I get no residuals in okay. my life. Okay, so... I, by the way, what am I getting for this? Anything? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... I, I, and by the way, since it's a collab, I got to let you know that um, I got like 75 subscribers on YouTube, so congratulations. Thank you. It's a but, windfall for us. Yeah, I know. So... Um, yeah. I'm glad I can bring you up. We're, no, betting, well, we're betting on your success. <laughs> so... Um, Mark, these things take time. You know, people want to start podcasts. I always say, be patient thank you i feel seen by you <laughs> we're having a, a whole moment go ahead all right i think i lost my damn train of thought <laughs> uh we were talking about <laughs> ali mcbeal you shouldn't paid. have got so no, the stoned before chart. you did the podcast You're, i know why do i do that to myself um he's gosh. blitzed as a kite right now <laughs> you want to take I, that ad break and then yeah we'll let's take an ad okay. break <laughs> All right, I don't remember what the hell I was talking about, but I will say this. All right, so reality <laughs> TV, this is what I remember about my actor friends during that period, Mark, and I don't know if you experienced this. There was a line in the sand when reality started, and, and it was a belief that reality TV was just like passing through the night and if, it would be gone. If you were, if you were a uh, contestant, if you were a uh, cast member of a reality show, that was... We thought you're kissing any career in show business goodbye. Yes. You're never going to get hired for anything ever Because you were taking good money away from working actors. I don't know if there was an uh, altruistic reason. It was just that I remember going to a conference that Anderson Cooper was the uh, host of, and he referred to them as celebrities. Whoa. Which I loved as a phrase. Yeah. Well, um, he, he's kind of true. He's a Vanderbilt. <laughs> It used to be. <laughs> well, so get this. So um, I, one of my actor friends was like, and this is like probably 2003 or 2004, very successful guy, will not say his name. But he was saying like, yeah, I really, I'm really tired of this. So I think maybe, hopefully this is over in a year. And that was really the thought process. Of For it. reality TV? Yes. Yeah, I think it was, a certainly when it came out, it was the bastard child of television. And anybody who was a legitimate television person scoffed at it. And what then happened early on is that the numbers were ridiculous and the affordability was ridiculous. So it became, it used to be game shows and things like that where the fodder that was put on in the summer and other times while you're developing the big glossy stuff. And then what networks are realizing is that a rating is a rating. And if I can get, you know, 12 episodes for a million and a half dollars as opposed to one episode for $3 million right. and get it's the same business. rating. And so within the, there was this big rift between the scripted world and actors and then reality and hosts. I never got involved in any of that. I've always been a host. I've never been an actor. I've always hosted before this genre was a thing. That was how, what I did. How do you feel about the, the net cultural and spiritual impact of reality TV? Um, I uh, have a relative... <laughs> He, he, I'm, I'm wondering if you're fucking with me or that's no. I'm not. Question. I'm not fucking with you because yeah. I bit immediately. Um, look, it's the same thing with the, when they had a daytime talk show. Yeah, I was on. I was the fatted calf guest on CNN and on Vicky Lawrence uh, on some other shows like The View and stuff. Yeah, where they're like, you know, how can you how can sleep you do this night? right? And I'm like, two things. One is the viewer has the choice. Right. Don't watch. Yeah. Which I think is an important tenet in our climate today in life. Yeah. As we regulate and deregulate and constantly, what is the role of polit- uh, of government and things like that? It's like, okay. Yeah. If it's let, not the, work, let the marketplace kind of figure the, it out. Let's let the marketplace uh, figure it out. And all I can do is do what I do. Yeah. So I know that even the shows that were like Moment of Truth is a show that I did that I think is horrendous. But I held my head in a way that I felt okay about it. Yeah. Did, did a Brady three, Bunch guy take that over? No. That three, wasn't Christopher Knight? Pursuit. Oh. <laughs> wow. wow. That's so deep in the <laughs> lore of my career. Yeah. The, I think the third part of the, the defense would be, you're on the view. What are you talking to me about this for? You know? Well, you, 
you, again, you got to talk about what generation or decade of this we're talking about. So what I have a problem with is ambushes. Oh, you're where, talking about like to catch a predator. Well, to no. catch predators. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's no that. <laughs> no, that's a that, perfect well, ambush. Now I'm Hold on, we could you. we could actually crunch that a little bit because yeah. the concept of catching predators. Yeah. I'm a hundred percent for right. the concept of making money by setting by <laughs> making a TV show to entertain us catching predators is that gray line we're right. talking about. It's not 100%, so fucking gray. Yeah, right. and that I think is what's important here. Yeah. So I don't have a problem with willing participants exposing and doing whatever the fuck they want to do. Right. Adults. Right. But for instance, on the original Temptation Island, where we discovered one of them had a kid. Yeah. We kicked him off the show. Okay. And when there are shows like the Jenny Jones thing where somebody comes on the show expecting one thing and then when they get there they find out it's something else and they get killed. And then they go and kill. kill. Oh, okay, sorry. Which by the way is a testament to how far we've come in accept- accepting alternative lifestyles like gay people because yeah. that was how bad it was then. Right. But Oh, that Oh, I do remember I covered that. that on PMC. Yeah, Jenny Jones. They got, did like a short documentary yeah. that the New York Times was producing a bunch of documentaries. So, right, right, so, right. So, Willing participants, right. consenting adults in concepts that are up front, you know what you're getting into. Sure. Whether you watch or not, that's your choice. Right. So this is a great jump off point. Let's jump. So in early 2000, I consider myself an expert at reality TV. Good. In the early 2000s, really I was. actually was thinking, where are we going to be in 10 years? And I actually thought we are 10 years away from in a gladiator ring with guys with swords killing each other. We don't have the swords, but that's where the UFC came in, right? The drama of- We'll get to the swords. It'll just be very expensive pay-per-view. There you go. And it'll only be sanctioned in Saudi Arabia. But where reality TV actually went was where Mark was touching on, which is we would, or the productions would get really mean-spirited and lie to contestants and do- Really sketchy shit. I don't know where I want to begin here, but maybe... Oh, okay. So, do you remember a show called Superstar USA on the WB? So... uh, No. All right. So, here is... Obviously. Here's the structure of the show. It's from like 2005. (laughs) My my attorney has said that I'm supposed to say I don't remember that. Okay. (laughs) No, I don't. I don't remember. So, here is how the show works. Obviously, we had American Idol at that point. Mm -hmm. Maybe a couple other like little copycats. Before that was Star Search. Star Search, of course. Yes. Okay. So, this show decided, why don't we have contestants on? And it's a singing competition. And what we'll do is, because this is going to be really funny, is we will... Get rid of the people that can actually sing and will lie to the people that are horrible. I think I do remember this. It's basically a a litany of the bad auditions Idol had. Yes. But they thought they're legit. And let them moving on. And and fooling them into thinking that they were talented. And and that kind of falls under the head of, I mean, that, well, let's stay with this. Okay, so. I think it'd be fun to, after we see these clips, um, ask, what's worse, this or a modern day reality television show that I'll come up with? I've, I'm with you there, <laughs> Del. I've talked about a lot of television there yeah. with you. Okay, so I forget what this young lady's name is, but she just learned that she won. And I think this was like an eight uh, episode. The whole here. thing? She won the whole thing? She won the whole thing. She's gone through all the cuts and oh my God, oh my God. And they just announced that she won. And then they went through a package of how her journey, and then they're going to let her sing in front of the audience. So This is dinner for schmucks. This is that it. Movie. Abso- absolutely. And it's so mean-spirited. Right. Here we go. So let's watch it. Proved you were unstoppable. Wow. When I hit some of my really powerful notes, I definitely noticed some of the audience members' faces, and they were like, wow, you know, she is unbelievable. I think I am going straight through, and I'm going to win this competition, definitely. (laughs) Tonight, you faced off against Mario and Rosa and sealed the deal demonstrating without a doubt that nobody is more deserving of the WB Superstar USA title than America's newest, sexiest singing superstar, Jamie. Yeah, I have a lot of feelings about this right now. Give them. Stop. Stop. 
Okay. So this is abhorrent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for those of you who just look it up, it just means really bad. Yeah. Um, it's horrible. And because, and I've, I've made this case on shows I've hosted and <laughs> many times over because, listen, people look at me as a host and they're like, you've done some fucking crazy ass shows. Yeah. You did and, an antique road show. I mean, look how crazy that look was. Look what we've done to people. Uh, a moment of truth was really dark. Why have we not talked about antiques road show this entire fucking time? Mostly litigation, but we can talk about it. Oh, um, anyway, when, and I say this all the time, when we as producers and, and the, the presenters of the show are proactive in the misery of someone else and they're not in on the joke, that's cruel. Yes. And it's irresponsible. Yeah. And it should be illegal. Yeah. Well, that's the government stepping in on let the marketplace decide, Mark. Which is what basically, well, but there's a difference between let the marketplace decide what they want to watch and fair practice in media of what you're allowed to do to other humans. This is, so by the way, yeah. let, not to get pol- political on it, but from a libertarian standpoint, a political Republican or Democratic thing, it's, laws are there to protect the public against danger uh, of of being hurt. Right. So what you watch, I don't need to protect you. But if you apply unknowingly to a job, show up to the job, and yeah. the job is going to ambush you and hurt you, right. that should be. But the that, question is, this is probably within the kind uh, confines of legality. So I think we might be fucked either way. No, you know? it's, it's, it's legal. Yeah, it's certainly legal, right? But what I'm saying is, it's um, it's unethical. Yeah, and Fair. that's that's and the case for sadly a, hard to not watch. Right, exactly. So mm. people are too insatiable, and the producers are too reptilian, and that's why we need a big, big Did, federal government. No, Get we don't need any. I don't need any more government. Okay. <laughs> We're not no going to play that. But but let's let's put this into actual terms because. We are, we'll look at this, which is a glossy version, and we're like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Yeah. But now, uh, this is going to show my age, but let's just go on Instagram Reels and TikTok for a moment. Oh, sure. And um, the number of ambushed set-up gimmicks that happen. Right. Oh, my gosh. Are every day. And then go further. Twitter to, is to just a, death. To, it's just videos of death. Let's go now to a sociological issue. Yeah. That when a fight breaks out in public, my generation broke it up. Yeah, this generation videotapes, right. and videotape is the wrong word. Yeah, they record it on their phone. Yeah, it's horrible. Now I, is I, I, I have, we're just desensitized. By the way, there's you want to talk about me being the old school? There's video of me Chumley from the show Pawn Shop. Him and some of his horrible friends started kicking a guy on Hollywood Boulevard and beating the crap out of him. And I'm the one who jumped in the middle and broke it up. And it's it made TMZ. Pat, I didn't whip out a phone. Pat was like. How, how I that, was the good guy in tour wars, and you guys need to stop I, this right well, now. Well, now, I, now I'm just bitter because I've done altruistic, heroic things and got no press for it. Right, and I've even had press people that present when it happened. Yeah, and and I'm like a little bitter. I'm like, but, you realize I this, this, is, this but, should get us on the Today but Show. But listen, listen, that's not what we do it for. No, no. I no. do it so that Kalen likes me. That's why uh, I do everything. Now, he is, loves you. Is this show though? Is this show worse than my six hundred pound life? Oh, that's a great question. Although they sign yes. up for it, you want me to break it down? Sure. It's different because the people on my six hundred pound life agreed to be on it. But but this is now we're getting into like a philosophical no, we're disagreement not. because no, we're not. We're very. This is a very specific, very black and white thing. Yeah. One is I'm on a show not realizing I'm being I'm being victimized. Okay. The other is. We can argue philosophically if it's good for them to do it, but in 600-pound life, yeah. those 600-pounders said, I'm aware of what this is, Right. I'm aware of how I'll be exposed, yeah. and we can argue that it's the money grab or what they've been li- told to be on it, right. but they're aware of what it is, and they continue to be on it. They're kind of aware of what it is. They're hopped up on bologna salad, and they're not thinking correctly. <laughs> Okay. I, I've experienced that. Okay, so let's finish this out. So I think at this point, they tell her, by the way, the reason you won is because you're horrible. I don't know if I can watch this. Okay, then we don't. We actually. We, can, we have to. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I say I don't know if I can watch it, I mean, roll that clip. Uh, let's see. <laughs> is that the guy from Backstreet Boys? 
I don't know. He's the generic See? host of that era. Yes. We were looking for a person with such an unconditional oh. belief in their own ability that nothing could stop them. Oh, boy. Not even a lousy singing voice. I can't. I can't. Crazy, right? We gotta keep watching. I, and I'm the guy who hosts a moment of truth. I'm, that's why I brought it There's in. There's a twist to this show. Like I, I know people are saying we you're really a weren't right now. Looking for America's best singer. <laughs> we were looking for someone who, who thought they were America's best singer. This guy's really dragging it out. Oh, uh, yeah, it's a not ways. his fault. They're telling him to do it. Jamie, Tone we lied to judgment. you when we said you were a great singer. <laughs> what is wrong with that guy? Who are these? Who That's are the, Tone Loke to. Who but are we the didn't judges? lie to you about how much this audience loves you right now. Right. Does that clean it up? <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Wow. You can stop it. Thanks, Kaylin. I, I wonder where she is now, but she should call Mark Garagos and sue the living shit out of these people for ruining her life. Well, first of all, horrible concept. Secondly, bad producing. Because after they popped that surprise to her. Very anticlimactic. They don't you let her speak. So? It's her reaction we need to hear. Yeah. Oh, That's shit. where if there's any possible spin of something that cleans us like a rape shower yeah. afterwards yeah. is what she then says and how she processes this. Either she gets to say something to them right. or she cries or whatever. Right. But how did they let that go without her? Yeah, just, no, just well, we want to hear from the person. Cause when you see this in movies and television, they just run away, you know, and, and Oh, the guy who lost Manny before when they said he lost, he just ran out of the building like, bye, Manny. It was Mario. Oh, it was Mario. You yeah, know yeah, what sorry. sucks is to come in second in the worst singing competition. That oh, is, that's a good point. That is so good. Hey, uh, continuing down the insane narcissistic reality TV uh, road, uh, play a clip from Are You Are Hot. By the way, I feel like now in this episode is the part where you have set me up to now show a clip of something I've done okay. that I can't defend. We could do that. No, no, I don't want you to do that, no. but I'm saying <laughs> it's like the show within the show. Okay, so this came out of a bit from the Howard Stern show from Ralph Cilarello, one of his best friends. Uh, d- may he rest Were you ever in on peace? the? Yeah, yeah, he passed. Cirello, I think. Cirello, yeah. yeah. Were you ever on the Howard Stern show? I was a call-in guest during Temptation Island, the original. Uh, at three in the morning, and I I had four or five minutes. He he watched the show, but it wasn't like you know. Sometimes Howard gets way into it, yeah. And then yeah. he kind of like, yeah, okay. Well, he cool, wasn't whatever. with Beth now, living with a cat in a house and not leaving his house. He would have really been into well, it. Well, COVID is very scary, Patrick. Hmm. All right, well, let's play the clip. I will not have you malign Kalen or Howard Stern <laughs> or Kelly Clarkson. Those are my three. From Weston, Florida, Kevin P. Are you hot? Hang on a second. Are you hot? Can you pause this? You picked the clip that was mono? Look, I, I don't know what I was picking. <laughs> okay. Look, it's fine. All right, and that's play. the hill you're going to die on? No. <laughs> All right, so let me give the premise of this to the audience. Okay, cool it on the pecs. They're I'm sorry, Caitlin, do you mind pausing? <laughs> three idiots are going to tell, they're going to judge him based on three things. I remember this. Okay, his face, Yeah. his body. And his overall hotness. Here oh. we go. <laughs> uh, you look like one of these girls on the stage. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you an 8.9 on the face. Your, your features are close together. Your eyes are a little narrow. Set. The hooters are just too big. An 8.5 on the body and sex appeal. An 8.7. He's a hot young man. I mean, he's got unbelievable that traps. Be a little bit shorter, it, That's it Rachel. That Who is that, Mark? That is... Rachel Hunter, so give you- former Rod Stewart, Stewart's wife, wife and supermodel. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. I'm correct on that one. You are. Do I get points? Your face and eight. Yeah. Five, your body Thanks. also just big boobies, just like you said. <laughs> eight nine. I would give you also an right, eight so nine as far as sexual appeal. Lorenzo Lamas coming in hot here. Here we go. He's ready to fucking bro down. Well, with quite frankly, 
if I were to turn to somebody to tell me what is hot and what isn't, I think Lorenzo Lamas Jr. I think no Lorenzo Lamas, Fernando's son, correct, would be who I would. He's ask. flying helicopters now. Careful, Bless yep. Bless his heart. Mm-hmm. Lorenzo, hey Kevin, what's going on, man? What's up, man? Hey, how old are you? Eighteen. Eighteen. Nice bro. Hey. Supposed to be a secret. You know, you, you are so calm and confident for your age. It's yeah. blowing my mind. Yeah. 9.5 in the face, 9.5 in the body. You got it all put together pretty good, bud. So Appreciate it. We'll go 9.5 on the sex appeal. Yeah. Wow. You know, that's pretty definitive. But wow. is it worse than my 600-pound life? All right. Let's, we got a couple more of these. All right. All right. Uh, Can we do one more, and then I want to ask Mark about Antiques Road? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Okay, okay. Because I know we've been going long. All right. I'm trying to think if I should... To play a clip from Who's Your Daddy, which here's the premise. A girl was adopted. She was put up for adoption. Oh. This reality show put her in a mansion with five guys to interview, and they knew who her father was. And she picks who she thinks her dad Who she thinks is her daddy. And is there a prize? Daddy. And yeah. she got to know her daddy, Mark. Okay. Mark, right. Mark the prize is daddy. <laughs> Who's your daddy? Who that, are- that's a phrase just out of context. You should never say. How did? How long do you think the production uh, spent time picking out the hell. name of the show? Uh, I think it was pitched that way, <laughs> and there was no show. I think, <laughs> hey guys, I got a really great title. Let's build a show around this. All right, so uh, so that's super sad. Or I wanted to play Swan, the Swan. No, let's do Who Your Daddy. All right, this is very know. sad. <laughs> Wow. This is 2013, by the way. While we're looking at reality snuff films, we should just go all the way, right? I'm sorry, I'm just a little, a little nervous. I know you are too. Why? Why did you guys have to give me up for adoption? It was a very. Is this actually the dead? Turbulent mm-hmm. time. We weren't sure what was going to happen. Fox, of course. And so. Of course, trash TV. She made the decision, and I. Blaming the mother. So she wanted to keep me too, honestly. Yes. 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 I want you to know you were conceived in absolute love, and I loved your mother very, very much. All right, can you stop? You day. ready to jump off the side of a building? This, you know, we we talked earlier about who hurt me. Um. I knew I knew it would take time for you to open, but let's go. You're not going to say me, are no, you? No, no. It, it's it's these <laughs> small kind of fault lines in humanity that I witnessed that just make me unbelievably sad. I mean, the, to think that a father would go on this show. I know we're talking about it. They all know what they're signing up for, but this is where I ask about the mental illness. I mean, what kind of people actually do this? It is so okay, sick. I will say this. And without the judgment of sick or not sick. Yeah. But I will say that my per- – and, and let me also reiterate, which I say on on my show and I say it on my podcast and I say it in life, that I'm just a dude trying to figure stuff out. I have no letters after my name. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not even learned. But I do believe there is something in the world of interpersonal intimacy that's to be explored here. That for some people – I thought about this during Moment of Truth, which is – Possibly as despicable as all of these, except that everybody knows what's going on. Yeah. There is this phenomenon for the, for, and normal is the wrong word, but for most of us, intimacy, deep stuff needs to happen one on one in private. For a lot of people I've discovered, it's easier to reveal intimate stuff under the guise of having been forced to do it in a giant forum is much easier to broach the subject than talking about it authentically with the person that matters. But so you can always hang your hat on. (laughs) That's the thing. You can hang your hat on. It was a TV show and they forced me to do it or whatever. But what brings them to do it is the subconscious urge to say it. I hear you. I was in men's group therapy. I didn't like the idea of one-on-one therapy. I needed to be around a bunch of people. I think people are often far more intimate in front of millions than they are with the person that matters. I say it on temptation all, all the time. Mm. If you guys could have this conversation in your living room, this would be a lot better. Mm. But now you're doing it here, but whatever it takes you to have the conversation. It is an abnormality though. 
No, I don't, I don't know that it's an abnormality because you would have to do a case study of how many people feel that way. We're seeing a slice of people who did it on TV, and we're not seeing the slice of people who would do it on TV. All right. I think if you need to put things into normal and abnormal, it certainly seems abnormal to you and me. Yeah. But I actually find myself being intimate on TV quite a bit and stuff that I may not be so intimate in pers- interpersonally. Yeah. So I, it's not... One of the things that I've tried to do in my entire career, even in what some people would consider cons- despicable um, Who finds formats, your career to be despicable? I well, don't people look at Moment of Truth and think it's very much... That's, like one, it's, that's one blemish in your guys, amazing TV reality. Uh, MOT, MOT yes. cannot drag you down. <laughs> uh, I, I, I try to say it doesn't define me. But, but for those who have critics, like who are critics like you say, I agree. But what I always try to do is... Do two things. I always try to take judgment out of the equation. Yeah. That people are people, regardless of whether it's on TV or not, whether what they've done is despicable or not, by my judgment, I take that off to talk about what's underneath it. Yeah. And the other thing is to try to be as compassionate and honest to make a space for an actual conversation to happen, even when I've been hired to perpetrate a concept. So even on moment of truth. Good word. Perpetrate. I mean it like a crime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but I'll I'll explain what I mean by that. When I got hired for, first of all, Temptation Island. I mean, a uh, moment of truth. I told the story forever. I wasn't supposed to host that show. They had hired a host, yeah. and it didn't work out at nine o'clock at night on the pilot. Yeah, and they said we need you for MOT. They called me in at nine thirty to take over an already taping pilot. And I came in at 9.30 and started taping at 10 and was done by midnight to shoot the pilot and then went home and said, I'm never hosting the show. It's absolutely over the top mm-hmm. until my family saw the show and started a conversation about how interesting it was. Yeah. The point is what I think the reason Mike Darnell and the people at Fox hired me for Dick those Wolf. shows, Dick Wolf and, ev- and everybody else, yeah. um, was that even in concepts that could be absolutely exploitative, mm-hmm. I would always take the stance of maybe you shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, you were a nuisance. Well, <laughs> but then I realized that I that makes me complicit sometimes because when I say this is uh, – there was one episode in particular that I, I have problems with. In the moment of truth, there was an episode that I thought went too far. Yeah. And I said, I don't want to host this. I don't want, I don't want this to air. And they said, how about if you – if I allow you to go on the air and tell – the audience, what you think about it before. And at the time in my naivete, I said, okay. So what I did was I went on and I said, the episode you're about to see is so extreme that I asked the producers not to air it. But I was denied, and so it's going to happen. And then I realized by doing oh, so. Oh, you drew p- more people in. Yeah. I wish I could do it for every one of my shows now. Right, right. <laughs> because 100%. that's like, yeah, if you could just run a lower third that, you know, parental is not, not good for people to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If every show began with, like, look, what you're about to see is an alligator yeah. eating a human we alive. Just, you know, we you just, don't want to watch this. We just recorded a podcast actually last night where I <laughs> recapped my afternoon of the Down Syndrome uh, of Los Angeles uh, sundown event. And Pat said that we should put a topper on it. I think it's going to make people just rush to the episode. Yeah, well, it's behind a paywall. Yeah. All right, one last thing before we move on to Antique uh, Roadshow, a oh, wonderful, man. wholesome show. I do want to play this one clip. It's just 30 seconds from The Swan. They do this girl, Amy, so effing dirty. Okay. Yeah. And this is Terry. Uh, Terry. Um, Black. Cruz? Uh, no, Terry. He's on Botch now. Rhymes. No, who's married to Heather Dubrow? He- Terry Dubrow. Here we go. He love team. Who's married to Heather, Heather Dubrow? She yes. felt like a loser. And Dr. Hayworth, she was very cruelly told that she had a face for radio. I mean, what would you say to that today? Well, all I can say is despite the fact that she underwent a number of very difficult surgical procedures, she today is saying, look at me now. Dr. Worth, Amy has some an major interesting dentists, answer to that question. She? Amy's a singer, so her smile is very important to her. Oh, when get she ready came for to this. the program, she had severe ah! pain throughout her mouth. So we did a full mouth reconstruction to give her that natural. Damn, smile girl, they did her dirty. Product. By the way, great, well, we'll same teeth. <laughs> no, you, moment, first, you got great teeth, Mark. I paid a lot for them. Amy that joined us three months ago. My dream is to just sing, to be a performer. Just stand in front of a crowd of a thousand people. Oh, did they take her veneers off and then oh, take that picture? No, was that picture was them filing her teeth down nose. before the veneers. I, I, this was a very expensive show. I was told it like had six had months production because yeah, all the work myself. and people you know, would yeah, lose weight. How about the liability? Oh, 100%. Can't make it on her own. All right, so here's the reveal. we got to watch it. 
Oh, this my. plays into the argument I made on my well, podcast about social Here media. She is the the positive. Amy Williams. I'll, I'll tell you. Do you remember this, Mark? This show? Were you watching it? I couldn't watch it, but I'm aware of the people involved. I think they did a good job, but the whole. All right, sorry, Kayla. I, I can. There's so many places to go from this. Okay, so here's where I'll go with it. Okay. You can fix what's going on on the outside, but they do none of the work on the inside. And the question has to be asked, is it worse than my 600-pound life? <laughs> yes. Yeah, probably, right? Um, so, oh, there's so many feelings. I'm having so many feelings about this. But... Social media, two sides of it. When I'm watching this, I'm immediately flashed to not social media, but the trend of all people to Botox the shit out of everything. Thank you. Granted, these teeth are fake, and I love them, even though they look like, you know, a version of Steve Harvey's teeth. But whatever. No, they don't. So Number one answer. Number number one one answer. answer. Um, So so let's, let's be aware that what they were doing... Everybody's doing right, but they're choosing to do it on their own to feel better. So that's a big difference. This is be, basically yeah. the, the premise of this is you're not worthy until this. Yes. Yeah, it's called right. a race to the bottom. But now this is the argument I had with my friend Mark DiCarlo on my show about social media in general. That one of the things I love about social media, TikTok and Reels and all that stuff, is that people who look normal. And look like yeah, whatever they look, sure. and have syndromes and sicknesses and ticks and things like that. That's what we now connect with. We connect with the them sharing their authentic self. Not always, yeah. But that part I think is a positive. That we now you can be a singer who's great and look like whatever you want, and we're going to be okay with that because we've grown, and that's part. You of are this. an optimist, true. Yeah, but a large par- portion of the I yeah. am an optimist. Uh, You're uh, an optimist. A, a large portion of the population also loves to aspire to beauty or perceive. How many beauty. tutorials on how to? Con- the, I say the worst thing that's happening to to dating is contouring. Like the 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 makeup artist that we've all become yeah. means we have no idea what anyone looks like. I have a, I have two single friends right now, and yeah. they they. I, I assume girls are let down when they see them walk into, but yeah. they say in general, most of the time they have no uh, expectations now because Pat loves a, a, an elective procedure. Oh uh, yeah. I've had elective procedures. Yeah. All right. Look, want to talk some antique roadshow and yes, we'll get I out do. of here. And then we, we'll get out of here. Um, I'm just dying to know what elective procedures. You look fabulous. I had a double chin removal. I had a really fat face. I'd starve yeah. myself till I got like down to 160, yeah. and I, people would say, why do you have a double chin? You're so thin. Like, that's nice the people are awesome aren't they they are great yeah yeah so antiques road show mm-hmm. one of the most important television shows ever uh, ever on pbs my wife has loved it since she was in her 20s Highest and my a prime time show in the history of 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 uh of pbs it is so unbelievable that you want to talk about uh an exploration of of us you know the the stories of these people are so tender hearted and there's so many amazing people that come through those doors. The places you had to go to must have been disgusting though. No. So first of all, the real you comes out occasionally. <laughs> yeah. And then there's this facade of having to be cynical. No, it's, so I saw that beautiful underbelly for a moment. No, it's, it's called dualism. Both things exist. Okay. Real. All right. That's how you want to believe. He's it. just um, kidding. He's a nice guy. I've known this idiot for eight years. It's okay. Um, uh, what I love about, first of all, I'm so grateful to have been part of that show. Yeah. And hats off to those producers because it's one thing to do a show once. It's another thing to have it last for four decades. Yeah. So, and what I've said back when I was part of the show and what they are experts at is that we can all talk about history. And that's interesting to some degree. But what what makes the show so great is how they highlight where this individual was during history, right. our connectedness to the intimacy of it. And the way I always say this, here's a, a, an old-timey radio, the old kind of radios. And we could talk about it historically. This is a radio that was popular in these years. But hearing a woman say, see this, this 
ring on the top. That was from my great grandmother's teacup right. that she heard about World War II on the radio. Yeah. And then we're all connected. Ugh. And so I think, like all reality TV, yeah. because Antiques Roadshow is a reality television show. Yeah. With a lot of copycats later on, done with a little bit more gloss in their own way. Mm, yes. But you're, so, you're so right, though. It's, but it's, it's the, the telling of the story and yeah. the intimacy of, of and connection. It's all it, about connection. It makes our history and our stories like Life. more tactile. Yes. Than, Inter- you know. Interconnected as That's well, right? right? Like yeah. when you show like a... Trinkets you, are so lovely. Well, uh, my wife and I were, were gifted by my great, great aunt from 1920, a ring. And so that's going to stay in our family. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's so funny. We just had a uh, an ad person reach out for uh, the lab, d- uh, the diamond the council. fake diamonds, yeah. And I, I wrote them back that I, I let's do it. And she said, we need to hear more than that. And I said, all right, well, listen to this. I wrote another email. I said, my great-grandfather uh, escaped Russia uh, from the pogroms with my wife's ring. And I think um, lab-grown uh, diamonds are great because people shouldn't have to go through that to get a diamond. And <laughs> Wow. She said, I didn't even see that thing coming. <laughs> she said... <laughs> No, the lab, the Diamond Council hates lab ground. Diamonds. Oh, good, 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 good. And I was like, okay, well, listen to this. <laughs> she, she escaped Russia, and now that diamond has a story, and lab grown diamonds are disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so I think is that's that the duality you spoke of right what, there? What were the places that you would go to for? For the show, like I don't know why you think it's bad places. Like, first of all, no, 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 I just, he I, pretends to be a coastal elite jerk, and he's not all, that at all. First of all, between Antiques Roadshow and Prices Right Live and Wheel of Fortune Live, I've been to a million cities, right? Um, and they're you know back when I was doing Antiques Roadshow, and I haven't done it for many years now. Uh, they would go to cities that had a convention center big enough to handle what we're doing, and right. try not to repeat them too much. Right now, what the producers there, and by the way, Marsha Bemko, the executive producer there, genius at what she does, and, yeah. and someone that I'm thrilled to have worked with for all these years, yeah. and uh, learned a lot from. And she is the shepherd of, and I've said it all along. She's a shepherd of something that is Americana, and totally. And so, um, you know, and I always tell people always ask me when I was on the show, what's the thing you saw that was the the thing that made the most you know impact on you, and I always say that that was for the appraisers. They were looking at things. I was meeting people. Yeah, and that's what my stuff. was. Mark, right. can I talk? One of the most fascinating parts of that show that I love are the appraisers because I'm always fascinated by experts. They're the greatest people in the world. Yeah, someone such dorks that spends <laughs> that Seriously, much time though. on book binding or yeah. this particular well, I, artist. I have often said, furniture. Like, I've often said that they are. Um, first of all. When people are that passionate about a specific thing, yeah, that makes them very interesting people because it, the laser focus they've had on that means that other parts of their social makeup maybe atrophies a little yes. bit. Yes, so it makes it really colorful. Hundred percent. But the thing that I want to say about, and I could say this in general for all of the appraisers I met, is that what they really were passionate about was educating. Yeah, and they would meet you wherever your your educational level was. So if you Came to them and say, you know, say um, Kathy Bailey was the art glass expert. And if you knew art glass and you came and you started throwing around to let her know how much you knew, she'd let, she'd give it to you. Yeah. But if you were somebody who had no idea. Empty cup. She talked to you like a three-year-old, but lovingly. Right. So right. whatever your capacity for understanding is, yeah. they wanted to, whatever takeaway you could get that if you get an inkling of why we love what we love so much. And I think. That's a lot of what works on that show, too, yeah. is that when you watch the appraisers talking about something, they're so into it yeah. that you become into it. They undercut them a little bit, though, don't they? What do you mean? <laughs> oh, I have a question. What was the I really biggest, don't know what you mean. What was the largest appraisal ever on that show? I don't know, but uh, I was don't know. Was anything ever hit a million dollars? Yeah. 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 yeah the, sure. I think the Navajo blanket was a big one. There was one. That oh, was, my gosh. The Navajo blanket. Seriously, yeah. you remember? Yes, a hundred percent. One, it's the yeah. it's the one. And then there it's was the one. Even when I was on the show, there was one that had these libation cups from China that were appraised at a huge number, but then retracted that appraisal because um, they may have been counterfeits. No, it's something to do with um, ivory or jade. Or, uh, I really don't remember. 
but the the ability for them to be resold was then you know one of the things about that show is that they're very very ethical and conservative in their estimates and the accuracy of what they say. Yeah. So if they for somehow put something out and it's not accurate, they will retract it and change it. Sure. Or if it changes. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, you know, with the whole ivory thing, there was, you know, I saw collections of ivory handled pistols that were worth millions of dollars that suddenly in one day became worthless. Be- was that because of you the, can't tra- trade ivory. the ivory trade? Yeah. Even if it was harvested <clears throat> From non poaching and predates that, yeah. that's changed. I could get him a guy. <laughs> you know a guy? Hey, Mark, I, I'll pitch you a show. Why don't you and I team up? I'll produce, obviously, you'll be in front of the Can camera. Can I really quickly say this? <laughs> really quickly. Yes. I don't know where this whole, whole you know, psychological examination angle has come from. The, <laughs> there is a, a, a fact that these convention centers are largely populated with people just bringing in their shit. You know, it's not all valuable. No. Wait a minute. Hold on. Yeah. What I love about you is that you're looking for the humbug always, like looking for the hustle. Yeah. Let me let me give you some transparency. Yeah. What makes that show special, yeah. as opposed to anything else you see on TV in that space, is that the sheer numbers to make sure it's legit. You're right. right. So what happens is there are so many tickets that are available. You don't pay for them. So let's say there are 5,000 tickets in a city. <laughs> And I brought person, in my dad's stool. Okay, leave. Yeah, not not with legs, but stool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I understand. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I happens, interrupted you. That's quite all right. What happens is, in one day, as many as eleven to twelve thousand items get <laughs> a quick, not an appraisal, but an estimation of value. Right. What. This is to say is that what you see on the air is legit yeah. because it takes that kind of number to get 55 appraisals that are good for TV. Right. Also, how far from the filming or taping of an uh, of a day to where it makes air? So they have all that time in Months. between to figure it out, right? Well, to double check the research. That's what I'm saying. But what is also important to note, and I really, you know, I feel bad talking about antique Georgia. I'm not on it anymore. But from my time there, that... Marsha Bemko and the people that produced that show handled it in such a way um, that um, uh, what was going to say twelve thousand items, fifty five get on the air, but none of them are seated. Okay, as opposed to American Pickers and shows like that can do that. Oh, so there's there's and if it's discovered that the item you have you don't own, buy buy. If it's discovered that you're an appraiser or a dealer who brought in something from your shop, get out of here. Buy yeah. So oh, wow. Uh, no, well, the show has a tremendous so, amount of heart to it. It's and very, very real. what you don't real. realize is the painstaking effort they do to make sure it's legit. Yeah. And, the, and I always say that there's no other show on TV that will look at, provide a service for free right. to get an estimation of value from appraisers for 10,000 ap- items. The best appraisers, too. That's right. You can't just go to, you, you live in, I, I don't know. You some, can't walk into Christie's with your mother's right, face. 100%. Right, without paying a fortune. Right. So so they provide this service for free for anybody who has tickets and only put on the air the ones that are special and not, not particularly the most valuable. Right. I saw Babe Ruth Ball come in that was signed by Babe Ruth, worth a lot of money, and they're like, yeah, we've done a lot of those. Yeah. But unless there's a story that matters, and that's, right. again, Marsha Bemko and her team are looking at not just the value and the sensational aspect of it, but in the context of what we're telling story-wise, does it educate, because PBS is educate first, entertain second. Yeah. And, unlike TLC. Unlike the learning channel. Right, which the only word in that is duh. Yeah. <laughs> is still technically it's a channel Ma- yeah. mark let me pitch you a show why don't i'll produce it you'll be in front of the camera we'll pitch it to that those producers okay. let's do movie props and i'll be on the i'll be in front he of the stands camera. in front of the door and he calls people crazy yeah as they no uh, i i won't do that because <laughs> they already do that uh, a tv show okay you no, got an antique road show you gotta we have did, a they do movie one. props i do was a segment that just showed up on my uh, uh, that's rerunning now that I was in 10 years ago. So many which movie was props. costume jewelry from movies that's in town wow. here. The 
headboard from The Godfather 2 where it gets shot up. Oh, wow. That came in through Antiques Roadshow. Something okay. from Cleopatra was on Antiques Roadshow. I mean, come on, Pat. You got to have Marilyn another Monroe. one. Marilyn Monroe. Right, you got to have another one chambered. All right. Let me, I'm, I'm working on a couple. Okay. All right. We should probably get out of here. Yeah, we we'll have forever. to. Yeah. <laughs> it's your house, man. I, don't, I got nowhere to go. Until it's like our May. studio, Mark. We're yeah. going to make a lot of podcast magic in here over the next couple of years. Magic. Magic. Mm-hmm. I had fun. I had a great time, too. Thanks, you guys. Thank uh, you very I love, much. Uh, this is, by the way, my first, like, Real collab in the podcast world. And I was saying before you came in here that it was really interesting for me to be, in, in some circles, a veteran of a media, TV, yeah. but a rookie in this media. This is so and, much easier. It is so and much it isn't. easier. It is and it isn't. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know. It's, it's easy now. Yeah. 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 Podcasting's a whole fun world. Isn't it, Kayla? Sure is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. Please never wake Kayla up in the middle of an episode. All right, I got to go have some wine and watch some TV. Good night, everybody. Have a great week. Yeah, same what they said for me, too. Bye.